Hello everyone, I'm Karen Foley and it's Authors Night here at the Calabasas Library. Today's guest is David Chernobylsky, who has written a book, The Perspective, A Medical Volunteer Experience. You were years where you were volunteering in a hospital. Where do you presently live, David? I live in Calabasas, so okay. I'm, I'm a local resident. How long have you lived here? I was I was born in LA, but I moved. My family moved to Calabasas, and I have lived here ever since. <laughs> Did you graduate from Calabasas High School? Is that where you went to school? Yes, I went to Calabasas High School, but I left two years early and I went to Pierce. Okay. And now I'm over at UCLA. So that's my alma mater. Really? <laughs> so when do you start? Do you go there now, or are you yeah. going to? No, I I'm going there right now. I'm a microbiology major. What is your background that led you to being an author and interested in all these medical things and the uh, articles that you have written? I, for some reason, I have this passion for writing. I don't know where it comes from. It's just, it just comes out and just, it's, it's wonderful to write. I really enjoy it. I've always journal written. I feel like it's a wonderful way to remember your experiences, to record them, and to look back on them and learn from them. I, I remember specifically, I started journal writing when me and my dad went to Europe. He had work in Europe, and we'd always go there every summer. And I noticed that I don't remember the trips. I don't remember what happened. So when I started recording it, I could look back on it during the year, because during the year I'd be studying more than relaxing, and it was very nostalgic for me to look back on it and enjoy those summers. We had some, we, we were backpacking through a lot of Europe, low budget, because <laughs> it was, you know. But high fun. A lot of fun, very interesting. We, uh, I remember once we slept, <laughs> we got to this town in Italy, Padova. It's in northern, it's in northern Italy. And we got there so late that the hostel was closed. So literally what we did is we put the bench, there were just benches, and we put them up, like these tables, we put them up, we put our sleeping bags down, and we slept on the tables, and in the middle of the night somewhere it just started raining, pouring, just pouring rain, and I remember just laying there, just like, this is, uh, this is very different from my bed at home. <laughs> so it was, it's something just definitely memorable, and when I write about it, it just comes back. It just the, the emotions, the feelings, and it just, it just comes out. You know, I, I like doing it. You save all your journals then. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's, it's very interesting. Sometimes I reread different things that I'll have the same thought, the same conclusion 10 years later, and I look back, oh, well, I already, I already knew that. This is interesting. So it just it's, sees how you know, cycle repeats. But when you said you left Calabasas High and went to Pierce, mm -hmm. did you finish Calabasas High? Did you give up one or two years and start immediately on a higher education? I got my GD and I went to Pierce College and immediately just went into the field that I wanted to go. Okay. So science, medicine, just something that really, really was interesting to me and what I wanted to focus on. So that's what led you to the medical experiences, doing your volunteer work. Yes. Well, this is very important to me because when I went to high school, we had to do a philanthropic project to belong to a social club. Oh. So our project was the orthopedic hospital in downtown Los Angeles. Yeah. And oh. uh, from then on, I think I must have volunteered 15, 20 years. Wow. Orthopedic hospital, <laughs> children's hospital, veterans hospital. That's really wonderful. And I can see by the words that you have written how it sort of resonated with me too. The life yeah. in the hospital and the experiences in the hospital are unsurpassed in life. That is, that is great to hear. You'd have to be there really to have someone else understand what you're talking about. Now, what hospital great. was it that you wrote about primarily? I or was it about, a series of hospitals? It was, it was three different hospitals. It was Kaiser Permanente, which is our local one here. In Woodland um, Hills? Yeah, mm -hmm. in De on DeSoto. And it's also UCLA Ronald Reagan Hospital, as well as Keck uh, Hospital of USC. So that was three 
hospitals that I felt were hospitals I could have very interesting and unique opportunities. And I did. Yes, you did. <laughs> so you kind of conflated did. the three hospitals into one production book. Yeah, just it, I, I made the schedule so that every you know, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, I'd volunteer on consec consecutive days at the hospitals. And it just it worked out really well. Just each hospital was different. It was its own thing. So it worked out really well. Why did you pick hospitals? Because of the fields that you were going into, ultimately? I picked hospitals because I genuinely wanted to know what the hospital setting was like. I specifically wanted to know what the real Grey's Anatomy is. Because I was curious about medicine. Well, well that's a dramatic show that always it, has a happy ending. It does. It, it definitely does. It's very interesting. It's also very much about the people, you know, and their yes. interactions with each other. I was more curious about, well, what happens with the patients in terms of, you know, is this real? Is, is what I'm seeing really what happens in the hospital? I just wanted proof. And uh, I went in and I got my proof. What did you prove? I asked myself if I want to do this, be in the hospital environment and dedicate my life to it and all parts of it. And I found out that there are so many more questions out there that by answering my first question, I just got a whole bunch of more questions, which is, for example, do I have the will to do this for my entire life? Is it, are you able to deal with a patient death, for example? That was one of my concerns in the beginning, especially as I was worried. I saw this patient die in the operation room, and I thought, can I handle this? Would I be able to handle this? Would, would I know that I did my best? And for me, it was important to know that I am striving to do my best. Doing your best for what? To help people, because people, I believe, are very important. We're surrounded by people every single day. They are all around us, and each with their own experience, their own life. And that life, I believe, should be treasured, should be kept alive, because a person has an opportunity to live it, however they choose. So you, keep, you feel your person should be kept alive regardless? Yeah, I, I value life. I definitely value life. Quality of life or the, just the existence of life? I believe that giving the option of having life is a, is a very powerful thing because when you give the option of life, the person is more likely to live it a better life. Who should make the decision? Of course, the person, the person whose life is at stake. It's their decision, it's their life. But if they want to live it, I believe they should be given the opportunity to live it. Right? There. Yeah? Because I'm speaking from a personal perspective. I had two near-death experiences. I shouldn't be here today, but I am. And I'm very happy to live my life the way I want to live it. That is the clue. To live life on one's own terms. Yeah. And that's the, the experience that I learned through talking to these people, these patients who had lived their lives, who also wanted to live, who were worried about certain things, who were nervous, who were happy. They taught me that it's important to live your life exactly the way you want it, but you have to want something. And it gave me, it gave me a goal, it gave me a drive, it gave me real passion that I, I've been using to fuel me for these ever since. So. so you chose the research part of life mm. and keeping it rather than the applicable part of life where you would be a physician or a nurse I think there are, or a technician. I like all aspects of it. I like the researching because you find new information. I like the patient interaction because you deal with people and direct contact and 
you know, making them smile is always a lot of fun because when a person smiles, there's some energy, some happiness that is... But you're, you're going into research, are you not? I'm going to research. I'm looking into different aspects. I did research at uh, USC with cystic fibrosis, um, but also in, I'm going into the field of medicine. So I'm looking into medicine and research in medicine as well. What kind of medicine? I really like surgery. I'm keeping my options open. I'm, I'm looking around because I haven't seen everything. There's a lot out there, many options. But so far, especially from the perspective, what I learned is the surgery is amazing. The first time I was in the operation room, I, I had so many thoughts, so many ideas. I couldn't, I couldn't keep them in. I remember I, I, there was no paper around. I had no paper, no pen, no, no phone to write on. And I grabbed a roll of paper towels, just made like a bunch of sheets, and took a pen and just started writing, just writing in the operation room. I think I wrote like 16 pages, just of thoughts. The, the surgeon was just, he, he looked up and he's like, what are you doing? I'm writing, I need to write down my thoughts, I need to get this out. Okay, all right. The next day when I came into USC, they had a spiral for me. They're like, okay, you're, you're writing on this now. So it just, it's the emotion that I get there, the energy, the... So you've been in the surgical room, the yes. surgical, in the surgical mm -hmm. theater as an ob observer. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was definitely there and, you know, a lot of, I met a lot of great people um, volunteering at the, at the operation rooms, learned a lot about different procedures, why one thing is done over another thing, and just interesting to see this. It's something that's, it's my calling, something I want to do with my life, so. You ever watch the surgical channel? Or do you see surgery on TV? You see, that's, that's the weird thing. When I watch surgery on TV, it's, I'd rather, I'd rather see it live. I'd much rather see it live, because well, I'm Well, it's there. not as hands-on. Yes. And I don't <laughs> mean, you know, literally, hands -on, <laughs> figuratively, you can see and sometimes hear why they're doing the decision, but it's of still course. a fascinating thing to watch. No, it is, and, and, and I do enjoy it. I do enjoy it very much. So. Do you read medical books? I, what do you define medical books? Because I have a library of Grey's Anat of the original Grey's Anatomy, not the show, the book. No, and not the theater, just medical journals from which doctors do their research. Yeah, I've been, I've been reading into a couple mainly because I'm looking at different sources of interest right now for me. Cancer research, stem cell research. I'm taking biochemistry right now. And I think uh, enzymes are very interesting, just how the body works. So a lot of different topics that are, you know, it's very important to focus your direction, but there's so many wonderful things out there. So it's a little... It's the banquet of opportunities. I know, and it's, it's really... Let's take a really quick wonderful. break. Okay. We'll come back and thank our TV audience for sticking with us. We'll just take a very short intermission and come right back. Keep your family safe. Improve your gas mileage. Extend the life of your tires. How do you do it? It's easy. Just check it. Your tire pressure, that is. Keeping your tires properly inflated protects the environment, gives you peace of mind, and saves you money for more important things. So just check it once a month. A message from CalRecycle. Hello, everyone. I'm Karen Foley. We're at Authors' Night, and our guest, David Chernobylsky. Now, you said that one of the reasons that you wrote the book and did the volunteering work was you had two near-death experiences. Yes, that was... Could you tell us about it? Uh, yeah. Um, so they're both sinusitis conditions where um, basically your sinuses just can't handle the mucus sometimes, and it leads to a lot of pain in your... Like a head. sinus infection. Yeah, it is a sinus infection, and it's, it's a lot of pain in the head. Mm -hmm. But the, the worst case is when it goes into the brain, which leaves you a vegetable. 
I got lucky. It did not happen to me. Instead, um, somehow I got through it the first time. The first time I had it was... With medical help or just on its own? My dad, somehow in Italy, somehow he got antibiotics. Okay. And that worked. We didn't have it throughout most of the trip. So it was a lot of pain and just difficult getting through it. Um, and the second time was actually at home. It was worse. But this time I had help with um, a doctor, actually, a good family friend. I call him Dr. Victor. Um, he was like my, he, be, he became like my grandpa. He took care of me. He taught me how to take care of my sinusitis. He told me about the importance of cardio, you know, to run every day, to ventilate the system, to be very healthy, to eat properly and to do different things properly and leave a healthy lifestyle, which allowed me to not have any problems anymore of it. And it was very helpful. And Dr. Victor was also the same person who told me to pursue going to the hospitals and seeing the real hospital environment. He was one of the factors that got me into it. What tasks in particular were you mainly assigned to in the various hospitals as a volunteer? Mm -hmm. um, at, Ki at Kaiser, I was a care partner. So that was basically helping nurses to care for the patients. In what way? You could bring them a water pitcher, you could help them out by talking to them or bringing them food or snacks. Something that, you know, the nurse was, you know, cleaning a bag or cleaning a bed or doing something that was, that took a lot of energy, took a lot of time. And the minor task would be, you know, if you could help out and would be happy. I was happy, always happy to do so. That was Kaiser in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And throughout the year, especially that year um, that I write the journal, is uh, when I started the Novel Companions program. Oh. Yeah, it was, a, it was a play on words because novel is new, but also the, the uh, volunteers were reading to the patients, so Novel Companions. Um, so I helped create it with my um, volunteer manager, uh, Avi Zaraya. And, um, and we kind of got everything to work together. And what I'm, did you do? Basically, we would go around and we'd read to patients, either poetry or short stories, different things. Reading is tremendously healing. The first, first time I saw, uh, I got the idea, I saw a mom reading to her son, who was a patient at the hospital. I thought, well, why don't I give this a try? And I had my, um, my English textbook on me with uh, William Blake. So when I went into a patient's room, this patient, she couldn't speak. She had, um, she had brain surgery, and the doctor said that they didn't know who this was. They didn't have a name for her. Was, her name was you know, Jane Doe. I read to her some William Blake, and after that she said, thank you. You know, doctors came in, like, what just happened? Like, you know, could we get your name? Different things like that. And after that, I realized that there is a value to this. And I came up to, to my boss and I said, this has to be a program. This is very important. And throughout the year, we worked on setting it to work, getting volunteers. I would do interviews, getting the right people to participate. Right now, I'm a, I'm a novel companion. I continue with it because I love the patient interaction. I love reading to to patients. So do they choose the material? Do you choose it for them? I have different things. So sometimes there'll be comedy, sometimes it's horror. Usually I don't like to read that because it's usually not, not a fan favorite. But there's also, you know, classics, different, you know, Hemingway. We have, we have a bunch of different authors. Who are your favorite authors that you would read? I have become a very big fan of William Blake. I didn't get him at first. I didn't understand him, but over time I, I grew to understand what was going on. Also, I'm a very big fan of Robert Frost, especially... Um, the poetry. Yes, The Road Not Taken. That, that is, I feel it's very defining in my life, so I like that poem. Um, a couple, a lot of different, different poems, um, poetry and poets that I, that I really enjoy. 
Lately, actually, I've been, I've been reading to patients my own short stories, which just to see their, you know, how they react to it and what they really gravitate towards. Um, I found that stories that talk about people's lives, real people, is something that people are very interested in. You know? Have you done anything as far as compiling them for an anthology or a book or so? Or do you just keep them in your journals, your own short stories? Oh, my own short stories? My own short stories I actually publish in different newspapers. So I write for two newspapers at UCLA. Ha'am, which is the Jewish... You, I have got something here. Yeah. You did a story about the Jewish refugees in Shanghai, the Kaifen Jews. Yeah. It Those was one of my... That's actually my first uh, piece for the Jewish newspaper at UCLA. Um, is this your first? Yeah, that was the first one, and it was very nervous to write because I had never done something of the sort. Well, it's a fascinating story. They, The Jews have been, since the revolution, yeah. the, the Russian Revolution have been escaping to China and all over the world, and a huge contingency moved to China. Yeah, and China was to very... To avoid being drafted in the Russian Revolution or to yeah. be a victim of the wars that followed and the battles. And unfortunately, after the World War, World War II, they left. After staying there for World War I and World War II. Yeah, and, and that's... And that's... they left, but now there's a whole movement and have them come back. And they're very, um, especially in China, they have a lot of different museums. They have the Jewish Museum. Yes. They're very supportive, and they, they, they're very proud of that history, that they, you know, helped the Jews during this time. It was very much, you know, we had uh, several dignitaries come to UCLA to speak about the history and just their appreciation of it. It was nice to, to hear, and very, you know, I was very honored to cover it. So It, it was, was a cool. wonderful story, and I enjoyed reading it. I wanted to capture that essence because people do it, but they don't usually talk about what it means to them. So I just wanted to capture that essence of what is, who am I? What, what was this, why was this meaningful for me? And for other people, why is it meaningful? And it was my way of capturing it. And a beautiful way. I really Thank enjoyed you. reading That's it. Very and wonderful. our audience, we will be right back one last break for a few moments, and we'll come back to Author's Night. Global warming is a problem. Sound the alarm! Huh? We think it's an important thing to save energy. To protect the environment. To protect the future. Every Who in Whoville makes a difference. We need everyone! We are here! We are here! Together? Together? Together. We're we all make a difference. Save energy with Energy Star, and then you can be... Our solution. Yeah! Go to energystar.gov forward slash kids to see what else you can do. Hello everyone, I'm Karen Foley, and we're at Authors' Night, and our guest, David Chernobylsky, and his book on medical experiences. But I'd like to go one moment to this article that I noticed that is a feminine twist yeah. that you wrote, not ne necessarily about, women, uh, about medicine, but about women in general. Are you a big feminist? I am a feminist. I believe in equality for men and women and that you know, everybody deserves an education. Everybody deserves to achieve the highest academic achievement. And equality? Mm -hmm. I don't like equality. I've always felt that women were far superior than men. <laughs> that too. <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I believe that you know, for so long, women have been not allowed to do certain things. It's not, I don't believe that's fair. And I want to talk about feminist icons. For example, a big fan of mine is, or I'm a big fan of, Wonder Woman. That is a person who is strong, who... And a great airplane, too. Oh, oh yeah. Definitely. But she had a boyfriend. She had several. One in particular. I forget his name, but I remember the boyfriend. But I, I like the essence of Wonder Woman in the fact that she... First of all, the historical aspect that she's Amazonian the Greek aspect you know, drew me to her, and also the fact, the lasso of truth, the fact that 
truth was important to her. And yes. I, and I looked into... She was a moral person as well as yeah. a superhero. She was a great Hero symbol. Win. Exactly. And I thought, why don't we go back to who created her? What, what, is, what is going, what's going on here? And I found that Elizabeth Marston, who was the wife of Mr. Marston, she was the idea of Wonder Woman, that it was worked off of. And this woman is a very interesting woman. She was one of three people to get a higher education in World War I, World War II era. And I just wanted to write about her. I found out that she and her husband did research and basically found out that systolic blood pressure, so your blood pressure changes when you lie. So they basically discovered the first lie detector. And later on, they created Wonder Woman. And I thought, well, what if I put an interesting spin on it? You know, what if I say an Amazonian came to her in her youth and gave her a box? And she opened that box and she found something in it. And then she goes through her whole life with that idea that there was something in that box that drove her to do this thing and that thing that she accomplished in her life. And at the very end, you realize, I, I, I talk about how what was really in the box was the lasso of truth. And that's the same lasso that... Did she also have a golden lasso? Yeah, she had the golden lasso of truth, and that's what I was, I was referring to. So it worked out. It's but you did know scuba, scuba stories. You were a scuba, you're a scuba diver. Yeah, it's, it's definitely... You're a rescue diver? Yes. Where did so, you do your rescue tests? Uh, I, was in, I did my training and my rescue diving in Thailand, the island of Koh Tao. Yeah, I know. And uh, it, was, it was a great experience, just first of all, getting the certification. I remember I got the certification on my birthday, best birthday present. My ever. whole family, my two children, my husband are certified divers, yeah. and my son is a master diver. Really? Yeah. It's a great experience, but in Thailand there's so many fish, so much wildlife. Oh, it's I just see. Amazing. So many colors. Films, they're gorgeous. In fact, he's leaving shortly. Yeah. To go on, yeah, two, two trips a year, I think. Great. No, that's... Loves to be underwater. Hmm. It's just, it's, sometimes it's a little painful with, you know, with sometimes sinus, but it's well worth it because it's a great experience. It's surreal. Yeah. The also, colors, the creatures. Yeah, we actually... Um, I had the opportunity to be part of a team that would actually clean up the dive sites because a lot of times the the travelers would leave, you know, trash or garbage and it would kind of not sit well with the wildlife. No. So what we would do is we'd clean up, you know, bags or cans, different things, and at the end of everything we'd turn it in for donations. So it worked out really well because I got to do what I loved and I got to do something for a cause that I was also very much for. It was a great experience. And how scary to think that there may be no more fishes after a certain, uh, another 15 years yeah, or so, the, or the, corals. The corals, because the water is getting warmer, and corals need um, a very specific temperature, yes. a very specific temperature range, because the algae will die. And that's what keeps the corals alive and growing, which basically all the fish depend on. So it's very important to, you know, stabilize the temperature and not cause too much human interference. We are trying so hard to get the other countries to stop from killing creatures smarter than we are. No, it's a, a lot of times... Or the that, capturing and keeping them in aquariums and parks and yeah. when they should be allowed to be free. No, I remember, I remember specifically... Um, the divers knew this, uh, the ones that had been there for a while, to not touch the fish, to not touch the corals, because we have chemicals on our hands that are not, again, I just, the easiest term of saying is it doesn't sit well with the animal, it harms them. Looking is fine, but, you know, look, don't touch, just don't harm it. I feel so guilty, because for every shrimp that's caught, there's 10 more fish that are thrown in the garbage that go into a shrimper's nest. Well, everything is about a balance. You can, I believe, have fish to eat. So you, you want to eat a fish, eat a fish, but don't eat to excess. In the sense that allow fish to repopulate or allow, 
just don't go overboard. There's, there's, you know, you replenish your population. You, you allow it to live and thrive. You don't eat it off. You just moderate. You know, you don't. I don't, I don't eat fish that often. You know, it, it's, it's everything is in moderation and it's healthy. Also, if you eat, say, for example, we'll just take an example, fish. You eat a fish every single day, all day. That's not going to sit well with you. It's not good for you for a reason. No, there was a man who died. Yeah. That's... I read in the New York Times that he had fish three times a day. He died of mercury poisoning. Balance is very important. Balance. Nature exactly has right. its safeguards for a reason. But where do you go from here? In terms of? Your life, your endeavors, your future, your goals. Currently, I... I know that I'm studying at UCLA. I'm focusing on my work. I'm studying for the MCAT. You have a muse? Do you have someone who's taken you under their wing? I have actually several mentors at UCLA, very wonderful people. Right now, I'm actually writing an article about one of them for Ha'am. Her name is Perla Carney. She's the art director at Hillel. She actually pushed me to submit my artwork to several competitions, and I ended up winning the Santa Monica. Uh, Museum of Art competition. Uh, so that worked out really nicely, and she's been pushing me ever since in the arts. It's just something I like doing. It's, it's a passion. It, it just comes out, you know, especially when I, when I study. When I study really hard, when I'm so tired from studying, you know, brains overloaded from the science, that's when I'll go to the arts. That's when I'll go to writing, because that's my break to balance out both sides of the brain, it helps. All of which are very rewarding to a person's psyche. Yes, it's very calming and it's very enjoyable. You are know? you going to continue your volunteering work? Yes, I still continue at Kaiser and it's very, very wonderful and I, I will continue for sure. Now, didn't you write another book about a cat, is it? Yeah, I wrote a Cat's Kiss Goodnight. It's currently in the works. This okay. is how I'm going to leave it right now. Um, you know, so that, that's, that's working, that's going. I'm not touching it right now. But right now, just focusing on school, first of all. You know, getting everything together, getting get everything streamlined. And also writing, because I just, I love it. It's a lot of fun, and it's just, I'm growing with it. These, these writings, these newspapers have given me an outlet to expand my writing, to really hone it, you know, and it's... It's really great. Really enjoy it. So, anybody who wants to find you or reach you, do you have a website that we can uh, put on? The I currently screen? don't have a website. I should get one. Probably. You should have a website. I will. I will make one soon. But if someone wants to read your book, I want to invite them here at the Calabasas Library, where we have a copy on hand. Yes. And have had one. Definitely. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And thanking Media Operations Department, the Calabasas Library, and you, our television audience, reminding you that there, you're the person today, the same person today that you will be in five years from today, with two exceptions, the books that you read and the people that you meet. And thank you very much for allowing us to meet with you. Thank you for having me. This was wonderful. Thank you.